Hey guys. So I've barely left my apartment since March. My hair is a nice awkward length and I'm really fucking bored. So I figured now's a good time to do something I've been toying with the idea of doing, which is just becoming an unhinged Yu-Gi-Oh! YouTuber. I... <coughs> I just like to talk about it, especially now in these trying times. So I'm a pretty big Yu-Gi-Oh fan. I've watched most of the Yu-Gi-Oh media. I've consumed most Yu-Gi-Oh media. I have a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh collectibles. I even have a fucking Yu-Gi-Oh tattoo. Got him. So I think it's within my authority to say that Yu-Gi-Oh GX is the best Yu-Gi-Oh series. And if you disagree with me, you're factually wrong. And I know what you're thinking. Karina, I completely agree with you, but I would like for you to explain further. So I will do that today. You're welcome. Just a few disclaimers. I will be spoiling basically all of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Big spoilers, small spoilers, very, very specific spoilers, very minor things. I'll be doing all of that, so. The anime has been done for like 12 years. I'm gonna spoil it. Two, sorry if my setup sucks. Believe it or not, it's really hard to get um, any type of webcam equipment right now. And sorry about any background noise. I live in a place. And three, if it sounds like I'm speaking a little bit in a hushed way, it's because I am. I'm very shy and I'm very nervous doing this. Please be nice to me. Hope y'all like ASMR. Cause that's just how I talk sometimes. I'm sorry. So I'm not scripting these videos cause that would be a lot of extra preparation, which I'm too lazy to do. And I thought it would feel more natural if I just speak kind of out of my ass like I do when I whip out my Yu-Gi-Oh trivia at parties. So I think a good entry point into my world of Yu-Gi-Oh GX theories would be not to talk about Yu-Gi-Oh! GX itself as a whole yet, but rather to focus on one character who I think is one of the most interesting characters in the entire Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise. So point one, we need to talk about Misawa. So about a year ago, actually, it was probably the last time I tried to make a point about Misawa on my Twitter because I put up some dual link screenshot kind of pointing out that he has essentially reached meme status within the Yu-Gi-Oh canon itself, which is, there's a few characters like that. So I just was talking about how I found him to be one of the most interesting character arcs in the entire series, and a lot of people disagreed with me or just kind of wrote him off or just repeated what I believe was a little Karibo quote at me, which is like, yeah, little Karibo is really cool and funny, but it would be really great if the rest of you wrote your own material instead of repeating it ad nauseum at me. And ever since then, I really wanted to like discuss Misawa's character with people because I think he is written off too easily and he has a really wild character arc that I think really captures the spirit of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. It's wild. So Daichi Misawa, aka Bastion Misawa, he is introduced immediately in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, first episode, he's there. And he's actually introduced as like a secondary rival to Judai alongside Manjome, because he is shown to be incredibly capable and very intelligent. He's kind of Judai's foil in those senses, whereas Judai is just an absolute empty-headed idiot at the start of the series. And during the first arc of the first season of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, he is a very capable character. He beats Manjome like he is giving Judai a run for his money he is you know at the top of his class he is he's kind of a cool character he plays these like cool elemental dragon decks and he has like multiple decks I don't remember how many of them we even get to see in the end um so that he can like counter different strategies you know he's like this big old phoenix right looking ass he is nerdy, sometimes to a fault, but he's intelligent and that makes him responsible, which kind of means he contrasts a lot with a lot of the main cast who are just rock-headed teenage boys. And he's in like the, the main line of characters and it really seems like they're building him up to stay there. 
But then something happens. So in the second half of season one, we finally get like our plot line. There's these keys that like need to be guarded. And there's just like the keys to the apocalypse. So all the main characters get involved. Most of them have one. Misawa has one, which means he's, you know, mm. things are going fine and dandy until episode 36. Episode 36 is when we unlock Misawa's final character trait, horny teenage boy. So episode 36 starts with Misawa, like at the crack of dawn, thinking about how he can't be distracted protecting his key from like the villains of the week who show up and try to steal it. And while he's thinking about like the cards in his deck, he remembers this one card, which upsettingly looks like a very little girl and he like becomes flustered at the thought of it. So he goes and wakes up like Judai and company at like 6 a.m. to go practice drawing cards like on a cliff top because he's a horrible friend. And while they're all like doing their card exercises, you know, being rock-headed teenage boys, they start talking about how they think some of the cards in their deck are like kind of cute. And they're like, would smash. I mean, Sawa gets really upset about this. And then like the opening plays, it's weird. So the plot of this episode is that a bunch of male students have gone missing. And so like the whole gang goes to find them in the big forests that cover the school island. We'll get to that later. And in the forest, they find a freshly built coliseum and they're just like well this wasn't here before so they walk in and there's all the missing students like building the coliseum and leading it all is this incredibly hot amazonist woman named tanya and she's like really tall and really hot and she has a tiger and it's like wow I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. So they find out she's one of the people trying to steal the keys. And they're like, oh shit, we got to duel her. She's going to steal our keys. And she's like, I'm going to duel this Misawa guy because he's kind of cute. And Misawa's like, that's not going to work on me, woman. <laughs> oh yeah. And part of the win condition is that if Tanya wins, she's going to marry Misawa. <laughs> so they start dueling and... Tanya's kind of laying it on thick with Misawa. Like she's calling him little pet names and being really flirty and being really cute about the whole thing. And Misawa starts to fall for it. He gets really flustered and distracted. He begins to like fall madly in lust with Tanya, which is like, yeah, I mean, I don't blame him, but also, you know focus so despite the way that misawa has been built up as a character in the run of Yu-Gi-Oh gx so far he actually ends up losing this duel because he got kind of horny about it and that's ultimately the downfall of his entire character so once he loses tanya like kicks everyone out of the coliseum except for misawa and they fuck all night I'm kidding. They don't do that. That's nasty. But here's the thing. They duel all night. They play Yu-Gi-Oh all night. And everyone else is like waiting outside by a campfire because they're like, we can't leave Misawa behind. He is still a main character at this point. So they're waiting by a campfire and they're listening to like Misawa's pleasured, agonizing screams all night until sunrise. And... Like, they don't fuck. That's gross. I'm not a freak, I swear. But I'm just saying, like, as a visual storyteller, the way that they choose to present this part is just, ooh, something about it. So, you know, come morning time, the gates of the Colosseum finally open again, and Misawa comes out, and he's, like, disheveled. Like, his coat's undone, and he's flushed, and he looks like shit. <laughs> he doesn't actually look any different than usual, but... He has a very nasty aura about him as he leaves this coliseum. And everyone's like, Misawa, what happened? And he like collapses into their arms. He's just like, I wasn't man enough for her. <laughs> so Tanya dumps him and Misawa is absolutely heartbroken about the whole thing. He is just staring out windows, 
head empty. <laughs> so naturally they have to go back and like duel Tanya. I also, she got his key, I guess, whatever. This time Judai duels her because he has zero interest in women. So instead they do this fun thing where they just like astral project at each other and like beat the shit out of each other. Fist fight. So weird. So he wins, of course. And then something life-changing happens. Tanya, like, I don't know. This It's never really explained super well what the fuck is happening at any point in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, but, like, she loses her powers. Uh, she, she loses her powers, which revert her back to, like, her true form, which is a tiger. She's a tiger. And she like locks eyes with Misawa, who is watching this whole thing, still like madly in love with Tanya. And he's just like, oh no, I fucked a tiger. And everyone knows, because they all heard it. Again, they didn't really fuck, but like the implication, the parallels. So that happens. And then, and then something shifts. And after that, Misawa's like not a main character anymore. Like he's still around for the rest of season one, but like he doesn't really do anything. He doesn't do anything. <laughs> there is like this one episode where everyone's cosplaying as dual monsters and Misawa does show up cosplaying as Tanya's pet tiger which is just pathetic but other than that he has like nothing to do and it's just really weird given the way that he was brought into the series and put at like the same level as everyone else and then he had nothing to do so okay and then season two starts and Misawa still kind of has nothing to do but something's different now Misawa starts to get actively ignored by his friends it's kind of funny. Like, Misawa will walk into a room and people will be like, who is that? Oh, right, it's Misawa. I forgot he was in this show. It's literally written into the show. That's just his character in season two. And it comes out of nowhere. But it's not exactly that he kind of becomes a running joke of a character and it's written off as like, haha, funny. Like, he's still a character. This is just happening to him for some reason. I guess you have sex with one tiger and all your friends don't want to be associated with you anymore. So the plot of season two is that there's like this brainwashing cult and they come and brainwash everyone and it's just a matter of not getting brainwashed. And like Manjome gets brainwashed and Asuka gets brainwashed. Everyone's getting brainwashed and it's like spooky. But Misawa has not been brainwashed and he's pissed about it. Because it's not that he's not been brainwashed for lack of trying. It's that no one's trying. No one wants to brainwash Misawa because no one remembers that he exists. This is a plot point. So eventually Misawa like gets tired of being ignored by all of his friends and peers and just walks up to the cult leader, Sayo, and he's like, dude, why won't you brainwash me? And Sayo's like, I forgot about you. I mean, I guess we can duel now. So they duel and Misawa's putting up a good fight, but he gets upset that like everyone is ignoring him and he basically really isn't in the friend group anymore which you know anyone would be upset about that but like he's just like i want to be in a friend group so he throws the duel so that he can just become brainwashed and then he's part of the cult but don't worry he gets better in the best way possible so misawa joins this cult and he's just kind of doing cult things and he's like wearing the cult uniform which is all white and he even like dyes his hair completely white which is like oh baby your hair and he's doing all these things but like no one likes him still because he fucked a tiger that one time and now he's a social outcast so he's still upset and then one day this scientist i forget his name it's like einstein's weinstein 
It's a German name. The scientist shows up at the academy to like do something. I honestly don't even remember. Satellite, space, physics. He shows up and Misawa is like, whoa, that's a scientist that I know because I'm a nerd. I'm going to follow him. So the scientist wants to like duel Judah and I honestly don't even remember why. It's just it's just set up for the episode. And Misawa kind of sneaks in to watch because he's a nerd, but it wouldn't even matter because no one knows that he exists anymore. So silly of him to like hide and watch. Judai and the scientist duel and the scientist is saying all this really nerdy like physics shit. And Judai's like, I don't get it. <laughs> I'm Judai. But Misawa, Misawa gets it. Watching this duel, Misawa kind of has this revelation that he's like, what am I doing? Why did I join this cult where no one likes me? Like, no one likes me anywhere. But, you know, I still have a lot going for me. I'm like this big old nerd who likes to do nerdy shit. So Misawa like self-actualizes like in this classroom as the duel is finishing. And I, God, I forget what philosopher this is a reference to but it's a reference to a philosopher because he has come to like this eureka moment of like i don't need to be a part of this cult to shine i can do that all on my own literally all on my own because i have no friends anymore he reaches like this moment of enlightenment and he strips off all of his clothes he sheds away this uniform he sheds away everything he's naked now and he does like a lap around the school just as like i've discovered my truth and everyone sees him. Everyone's just like, oh my God, <laughs> Misawa, <laughs> you're pee pee. <laughs> and they all know that he fucked that tiger. So he like runs to the cliffs as the scientist guy is leaving. He's just like, look, take me with you. I like science. And the science guy is like, what? But he like leaves with the scientist guy and that's it. He's just gone now. Misawa, that's his season two. Nobody liked him anymore, and then he joined the cult, and then unjoined the cult, and got naked, and then ran away with a physicist, and he's just gone. He's gone for like 30 episodes after that. We never talk about him, but he does come back. So in season three, you know, just to catch people up on it, all this weird shit happens, and they get the entire school transported to an alternate dimension where Yu-Gi-Oh monsters are real and it's just the school is there now and it's weird and it becomes this sort of survival horror for a few episodes and it's kind of interesting but like it's really bizarre so at one point they're like looking out at the desert being like what are we gonna do like what do we do now and they notice like a harpy lady in the distance like doing some shit and they're like what's that and they realized that the harpy lady is like attacking a man and that man is Mizawa and he like his hair is long and he he's got like a really icky tan and he's like wearing a I don't know and <laughs> they're just like who's that and someone's like Wait, I think that's Misawa. <laughs> They're like, the guy who fucked a tiger? So they go save Misawa from this harpy lady. And he's like, yeah, I ran away with this physicist and no one noticed. We were building this machine that can jump dimensions or something. And I accidentally got sucked into this dimension. I've been wandering around for months. And no one noticed. <laughs> And everyone's like, whoa, that's cool, Misawa. Can you like help us also leave this dimension and I guess you can come too? And he's like, yeah, that's kind of what I've been trying to do. Like he's there, but he doesn't really do anything. And I mean, that's not a big deal. There's so many characters by season three and Yu-Gi-Oh! GX does a really good job of like balancing them all. So it's not like Misawa has to duel, but I'm just saying he doesn't. So Misawa just kind of helps them get from place to place in season three, which I guess is a nice thing to have. But at some point later, because even once they get back to the real world, they have to keep jumping dimensions to like find different people. 
<laughs> it just keeps going forever. So they end up in another alternate dimension where dual monsters are real. And they run into Tanya. <laughs> and Misawa's like, okay. <laughs> and long story short, they do eventually like figure everything out and everyone is like sent back home, except for the ones who aren't. And one of the ones who aren't is Misawa because they're like, Misawa, portal's ready. Let's go home. And Misawa's like, have some things i need to take care of here and they're like <laughs> tanya and he's like i mean not necessarily but and they're like standing together so you know they all go back home and it's like pointed out that misawa does not come back and he never comes back that's the end of misawa in Yu-Gi-Oh gx that's his last scene and that's it misawa's gone he's not in season four he's not in Yu-Gi-Oh gx ever again that's how it ends. He just marries the tiger and they live together forever in space. That's his character arc. And it's weird. Like, that's weird. And people are probably like, Karina, why are you telling me this? And I'm like, well, I like to talk about it. I think more people should know about it. So surprise, I've tricked you into listening to me talk about it. But I also think that talking about Misawa and the way that his character is written is a really good segue into point two. The experimental nature of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. So like, I don't do any research about this stuff. I don't need facts, I have my feelings. So when I say that Yu-Gi-Oh! GX was a very experimental series, it's mostly just based on, I mean, observation witnessing it. GX was like the first Yu-Gi-Oh spinoff after Yu-Gi-Oh, the original series, DM, Duel Mons, whatever. And I mean current day, we have like some really wild Yu-Gi-Oh premises. You know, you have five Ds, which is like, what if we dueled on a motorcycle and had strong themes of class divide? And then Zexel, which is like, what if aliens were among us and they played Yu-Gi-Oh? <laughs> Or God forbid, Yu-Gi-Oh! Arc 5, which is just Yu-Gi-Oh!'s Civil War. What if every Yu-Gi-Oh! series that exists fought behind the Denny's? So, I mean, compared to those, GX, which is just, like, it's in the same timeline as the original Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, it's within the lifetime of the original characters, except now there's, like, this Hogwarts school where you are separated into houses and go learn Yu-Gi-Oh! from, like, college professors I guess com in comparison, that's a pretty tame concept. But Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, I feel, threw everything at the wall. Yu-Gi-Oh! GX walked so that literally everything after it could run. GX had everything. Like, it rehashed a lot of tropes and plots and ideas that were in, you know, DM, but... It also, look, if you, if you think about any like story theme or trope or character type that was in the public consciousness in 2004, it was probably in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Such as pirates, spirits and fae, alchemy, zombies, high fantasy, superheroes, Space warfare, ghosts, aliens, sexy aliens, sexy alien ghosts, Tarzan, <laughs> vampires, seriously, she was like a vampire for no fucking reason, man in test tube, school festival episode, hot springs episode, episode where we summon ghosts, <laughs> girl goes undercover as boy, haunted abandoned building, being a dinosaur, <laughs> what year did cars even come out, what the fuck, crocodile man, batman, actually I feel like idle stuff but it's tacky and unappealing because it's Yu-Gi-Oh! tarot cards i'm literally doing this off the top of my head i don't even know why i didn't gather my thoughts before this ojama 
being gay. The point is Yu-Gi-Oh! GX gave us everything and more. It gave us things we didn't know we wanted. Yu-Gi-Oh! GX takes place on an island separated from normal society. And it's not even an island that makes sense in context. There is a school on this island, but there's also an active volcano, ruins, an animal testing lab, multiple abandoned, like, spooky buildings it's big enough that one of the students just went feral and like lived in the forest for a few years <laughs> as mentioned before a coliseum ends up getting put there at some point mm -hmm. i guess by the ruins and it doesn't make sense it just doesn't and it doesn't try to most of the time and you know that's just what i like about it <laughs> but even more than its setting I think GX tends to push a bit harder with its characters sometimes, too. I mean, we've talked about Misawa, who's just an absolute freak. But it works. There are a lot of characters in GX, and I love all of them. Except Amon, he can fucking die in a hole. People will be upset if I don't specifically talk about Manjome, aka Jazz, who is just an absolute star. He's the official rival of GX, but I'd argue that GX kind of has about three rivals and Manjome's just the main one. He's kind of like new, the new Kaiba at the start. He's like this little rich boy who's mean and looks down on people. He ends up kind of being this comic relief character because unlike Judai who gets very cute and cool dual spirits. Manjome mostly gets really, really horrible, ugly ones who are lovable nonetheless. You know, you see this change in him of him becoming friends with Judai and becoming friends with these spirits that he claims to hate. And it's just nice. We love to see it. And he's just like a good character. Like he's the sort of character that's introduced as cool and is just like dressed the fuck down as the series goes. Like, oh, he wears black now to hide stains when he spills sauce <laughs> and then you have like Asuka who's like probably my favorite Yu-Gi-Oh lead girl even now I just like that she is a nice respectable person like a real ace duelist she doesn't take shit I just think it's nice it's just nice compared to some of the things that we get. I appreciate that throughout the show, even at the end when they like throw her at Judai to make hetero love happen. She still has a lot of agency to just do her own shit. And I just think that's nice. She's just nice. And I really like, especially in the dub, she becomes 10 times more savage at points of just like, you fucking idiot fucking people. Then you have Sho, who's just such a good underrated character. Like, he starts off as this dweeby ass little, like, man, my brother is mean to me. <laughs> He's just a very helpless person. But over the course of the series, he learns to really, like, believe in himself and not listen to his horrible brother. And hell, he reaches the point where he can even go toe to toe with Judai and be like, no. You know, I don't need to follow you all the time. And I think that's beautiful. There's way too many characters to just cover individually about their goodness. So let's just cut to the chase with the ones that we need to talk about as well. Point three, the themes of failure. So Ryo Marafuji, aka Kaiser, aka Zane Truesdale, he's kind of a, the second Kaiba of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. If Manjome encapsulates being the rival and being rich and snooty and awful, Zane is definitely more the overbearing big brother ace duelist awful flavor of Kaiba. And he's a character that I think as a wee child, I was supposed to find him kind of alluring. And I, I, yeah, a little bit. But the older I get, the more he disgusts me, but also the more I begrudgingly relate and pity him. So let's talk about that. So Kaiser is like the school ace. He's the valedictorian. He's the high school quarterback of Duel Academy. And he's just like, 
really popular with the girls and he doesn't want any of them. He's like top of the class. He's on his way to great things. So he graduates at the end of season one and he's like set up that like he's going to go places. He's going (laughs) to he's going to really take the dueling world by storm because, you know, he was great at it in high school. Well, in season two, he's starting to do his, you know, rise to fame in the professional world. And he has one bad duel against Edo. And this one bad duel, like sends him on this downward spiral of he just has a really bad losing streak and he can't recover from it and he's out of control and he's just having a really bad time because like he was supposed to be successful but instead in the real world he's just sucking and he can't pull it together and he ends up losing like his sponsorships and stuff and he's just kind of dueling in like these dingy nobody matches and everyone hates him And that's sad. That feel when you're trying to be successful as an adult because you were told you were gifted in high school and it turns out that the real world is full of people who are just as good if not better than you. Oh, So he has his turning point where he's like invited to this underground duel by this man who's just dressed as a magician for no reason. And he's just like, I guess... What do I have to lose? The answer is nothing. So he goes. And this episode's awful. I hate this episode. He goes and it's like this cage match against this like burly shirtless man in this like underground seedy club full of people in formal wear wearing like masks. And part of like the rules of this match is that he has to wear this collar that shocks him every time he loses life points. (laughs) And just to add another level of terribleness on top of that, in the dub, the big burly man is supposed to sound like Mike Tyson, I believe. And their Mike Tyson impression is basically just he's talking in baby talk. It's a Freudian nightmare. So he takes part in this match and it's just it does not go well. And it kind of ends with Kaiser being like, you know what? I don't respect my opponents because it's fuck these guys. Fuck everything. I'm going to be a bad boy now. So he goes full bad boy. Like he's dressing in all black. He like changes his name to Hell Kaiser. Like <laughs> he like gets this deck that's like his deck, but evil. And he gets really into this electro bondage thing. Like he, he ends up being really into the collar shit. And it gets to the point that he starts making other people like take part in that it's just like no he even makes show his own little brother who i forgot to mention he's horrible too even before becoming a bad boy take part in the electro bondage shit and it's just like this isn't right like this is weird just to circle back a little even before he goes on his evil arc is just terrible to show he's just like i'm gonna give you this card That's like a really good card that's perfect for your deck, but you're not good enough to use it. So think about that. Like, what the fuck? (laughs) But yeah, he has this full on breakdown where he just gets really into a weird kink and like everything is going wrong for him and everyone's like scared for him. But he's like, no, (laughs) this is who I am now. And in season three, he is kind of actively involved in like bettering the plot. Like he's helping, he's he's traveling around with everyone, going to like all the different places. I'd argue that he's like getting better by season three, but he's still like, you know, in his bad boy phase and everyone's still like, dude. And he even reconciles a little bit with Sho while they're like, you know, really in the thick of traveling to these alternate dimensions. And it's kind of sad because he knows he's a bad person but he just has a lot of self-destructive tendencies and he doesn't want to let that go but the real crazy thing is he's still doing the shock collar shit and it's gotten so bad that he's starting to have heart palpitations his comfort kink was so extreme that it's actively causing him health problems and it's not like implied or anything it's just really explicitly shown that like oh it'll show like a x-ray of his heart like uh, 
and it's honestly kind of uncomfortable because it's like oh no like that's scary at his big climactic fight against the big bad of season three you know he's finally starting to kind of self-actualize a little and being like you know maybe shocking myself so bad that it's causing my heart to stop momentarily isn't self-care and he's about to you know beat the big bad and save everyone but he ends up losing at the last moment but also his heart stops and he dies before he can even finish the duel he literally just dies like a lot of people die in season three of Yu-Gi-Oh GX but he we see his heart stop beating and it's ooh, like it's a little uncomfortable because you know that's his heart okay but the thing is like at least if you watch the original Japanese um he comes back he undies yay because he does not come back at the end of season three he is on the missing list at the end of the season which there are a few people like Misawa oops but he does come back in season four he just kind of mysteriously washes up on the beach and is alive which is kind of nice but it does raise the question of wait didn't he like actually die that's weird so weird dimensional shenanigans aside he is alive he he understands now that what he did wasn't the way that he should have dealt with his like real adult problems and maybe he should have talked to someone or not been emotionally abusive towards his brother and maybe not gotten into an extreme kink to cope with his pain and you know he learns all of that about himself now (laughs) and he even gets to the point where he's just like you know show i respect you we're we're equals now and you know that's nice but the thing is he still has heart problems forever now those aren't going away Uh, yay (laughs) and like kaiser's character arc always was kind of upsetting to me i mean not in the way that i didn't like it i thought it was nice and i thought it was like a really good character arc but it's just a little too real you know like he died in another dimension and somehow came back to life but he still has to face these like real repercussions of his self-destructive behavior and that self-destructive behavior came from the fact that he grew up thinking that he had it made and he was going to succeed and he took one step out into the real world and like fumbled immediately and he couldn't recover from it because he didn't know how to. And isn't that just hitting a little close to home for some people? You know what else is going to hit real close to home for some people in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX? We haven't even talked about my man Judai. Point four. Growing up and becoming a depressed adult. So Yu-Gi-Oh! GX as, as a whole is a story about these kids growing up. That's you don't need me to tell you that but you know you gotta appreciate the more dreary way it chooses to do it and sometimes while there is like a big supernatural plot going on in season four there also is a lot of time spent highlighting every character's anxieties about growing up and failing or not and what they should even do with their life in the next steps of it which is like been there sister show is reconciling with his brother and where does that lead them and manjo may just has no life skills like what the fuck is he supposed to do and it does just show everyone's path in life unfolding in a really comforting way and then there's judai so a lot of people will sell Yu-Gi-Oh gx as it starts off stupid but like once you hit season three that's when it gets really good and like that's kind of true it's Yu-Gi-Oh GX is two seasons of absurdist nonsense and then a complete emotional breakdown 
And I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Stop trying to make people watch Yu-Gi-Oh! GX if they aren't interested. But it really is kind of famous amongst fans for taking its happy protagonist and stripping him down to all of his worst qualities. And that's fun. So Judai as a character is really interesting. He's definitely open to a lot of interpretation. And, you know, we're going to be leaning on my interpretation of him. Sorry. <laughs> It's my video. So I think he's pretty commonly referred to as like a very typical shonen pro tag. Probably one of the most shonen pro tag of the Yu-Gi-Oh protagonist. He is, you know, headstrong and loud and like... <laughs> Judah is the type of character who's like, I'm going to be the best. And then he just brings everyone along on that ride. Like he's very charismatic. Everyone kind of loves him and they're all fighting over him. And Yu-Gi-Oh! GX really, like, puts him up on the pedestal of, like, this guy, this guy does it all. And then season three rolls around and dares to ask, but what if that's selfish behavior? So, in season three, we're introduced to Johan, aka Jesse, who is basically Judai again <laughs> and judai and johan really fucking vibe like they get along instantly they even do this thing where like they go in to shake hands and judai's like i feel like we've met before like maybe in another life and johan's like i feel that way too and you think because it's Yu-Gi-Oh that it's like they're reincarnated from someone like this is gonna this is foreshadowing it's gonna become important and it it's not that's not what it is that's just the way that they talk to each other because they're in love so these two become boyfriends immediately everyone's a little bit like that's nice like those two really are meant for each other but what about me show especially is like what about me <laughs> so later on in season three Johan has this whole thing. I'm not even going to get into it, but he disappears. He gets sent to another dimension. And Judai has just a full on thing of like, fuck, we need to find him. And everyone's like, we'll help you find him, Judai, because we're your friends and we love you. And so they all like go to another dimension together to like find Johan. But Judai starts kind of like, like he's running off without people and he's like not keeping everyone on the same page. It, it's not... It's not a good look. And so everyone starts to become annoyed with Judai because he's kind of not taking their feelings into consideration and, and not really appreciating the fact that they're all risking their lives to help him, essentially. And they start to become, like, kind of petty about it. Like, rightfully annoyed, but a little petty. So all of Judai's friends start to get really annoyed with him and they end up getting captured by, like, this warlord and Judai has to duel him to set them free. But they're all so upset at this point and it's also being influenced by the warlord's magic it's Yu-Gi-Oh that they're kind of actively just being angry with him and like yelling at him being like you know you're being selfish you did this to us and like that's a little bit justified a little bit but you know they're they're also like they're, they're giving him a hard time when everyone's having a hard time I don't know but the problem is they're being held hostage by a warlord, and as part of the fucking with Judai strategy of dueling, the best way to beat him, he starts to kill them off one by one. So Judai can't win the duel fast enough, and all of his friends end up dead. And like, of course, it's not all his fault, but like, there are some good points in that. And thus begins the emotional collapse of Yuki Judai. So after this, Judai goes full self-loathing mode he has a full emotional breakdown where he's just like damn all my friends are dead and it kind of is my fault fuck and all of this self-hatred ends up leading judai down the villain path and he becomes the secondary antagonist of Yu-Gi-Oh gx and he just starts killing people left and right because he is now the supreme king how i don't remember the exact plot but that's basically it so he needs to be rescued by his surviving friends and they do even though that they're like doubtful of him and scared of him at first they do rescue him but at the cost of their own lives so more people have died just to save judai 
And Judai is not happy about it at all. And he is angry. He is angry at Ubel, who is kind of actually responsible for this. And he's just dealing with a lot. Like he's dealing with a lot of guilt. He's dealing with a lot of anger. The blame is shooting out in all directions. No one knows what's going on. Everyone's dying. And it all accumulates with Judai facing you, Belle, effectively as demon, embracing them and being like, well, I'm going to absorb you into my body now and our souls are going to be one forever. What can go wrong? And Judai doesn't even come back at the end of season three. He is on the missing list alongside Misawa, who didn't come back because he wanted to smash. Kaiser, who effectively died. Amon, who we don't care about here. He's gone. He does come back like one episode later, but like it took him a while. It was weird, but like he's different now. You can tell something's wrong. So season four starts and everyone is like, moved on and kind of gotten over the entire trauma of season three which was really bad it was a total bloodbath and everyone's like promoted out of the dorm they were all living at together because they love judai and literally no one's living there anymore except for judai because he just refuses to leave and he's kind of not really attending school i forget he's just not having it he's having a hard time and all of his friends still care about him at this point like yeah that was a real bad blowout but at the end of the day they're all friends and they still want to help him but judah is kind of not letting them he's he's definitely had a major character change at this point where he's very closed off from people he's not the same happy person he was before and he's just keeping it all to himself. And ooh, that's kind of sad and hits a little close to home. And again, while season four does have its own supernatural plot that it's resolving, you know, if they're like fighting the concept of darkness itself, whatever. You know, the real value of it is all of the character drama of it being the last semester of their time in academia, I guess. And I think it's a very easy read that, you know, in season four, Judah is experiencing the throes of depression. I think that's fair to say. You know, he's cutting himself off from all of his friends and he's having a hard time processing the trauma of the things that he's been through. And, and he doesn't really think that highly of himself anymore. He kind of thinks he's a monster now, which is like, well, you do have a demon permanently glued to your soul, but that's not kind to yourself, Judah. But that's what he's got to figure out. And even if he's slowly reconciling with his friends and like saving the universe from whatever they do in season four, I don't remember. <laughs> he's still not okay by the end. You know, like they're graduating and he doesn't even show up. But at this point, his friends are like, well, that's Judai. Which is a really nice sentiment, but it's also a very lonely one. And I think the ending of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX is kind of beautiful in a really poignant and bittersweet way he crosses paths again with yugi you know circling back to the start of yugioh gx where they run into each other and he ends up being able to duel yugi weirdly enough in time travel i guess because it's whatever so he gets to duel against yugi who i guess kind of was his idol like his original king Ooh, wow in doing that he does start to relearn like I enjoy this. It's not always going to be about winning and losing. It's about loving what you do. You know, Judai was really passionate about dueling. And then he had one bad duel and it kind of ruined his whole sense of self. And he has to relearn that in order to learn to love himself again. Yu-Gi-Oh! GX doesn't end with Judai together with his friends. It ends with him alone in the desert with the demon that lives in his soul and the ghost of his dead teacher. <laughs> but he does have this little note from his friends that basically says, when you're ready, we're here. Because they understand that even now he's going through some shit, but there's still his friends in the end. And Judai alone in the desert isn't a hopeless person. He's rediscovering his love for things and the things that made him happy in the first place, but he's still healing. He hasn't finished yet. And he hasn't really reconnected with his friends, but he, they're really patient about it and they understand. 
and that's kind of nice. I watched Yu-Gi-Oh! GX as it aired, like, both the dub and the sub back when I was, like, 12, and you had to watch it in three parts on YouTube. And I was obsessed with it. I fucking loved it. And I kind of fell out of Yu-Gi-Oh! shortly after that, like, as I entered high school. Mostly because um, I really liked GX, just for what it was. And 5Ds is such a harsh departure from that that I had a lot of trouble getting into it and just ended up falling out of interest with it for a while. And then I ended up getting really back in to Yu-Gi-Oh! As I was finishing college, I was like 20. I was like still so in love with Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. It just meant so much to me. And I feel like the older I get, the more I really appreciate just the overall arc of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX and its characters and their absolute fumblings and how it ends for everyone. Because that's life, baby. As a Yu-Gi-Oh! fan who has struggled with depression and still does from time to time, I find a lot of comfort in the way that Yu-Gi-Oh! GX depicts characters growing up to have a lot of problems and not actually succeeding in fucking anything they do and having weird ways of dealing with it and having consequences. I think it's nice. Like, yeah, a lot of the story is kind of left open at the end, painfully so, but I think that's part of why it really resonates with me. Like, Oh boy, <laughs> same. And again, this isn't to like downplay other Yu-Gi-Oh series. Like, oh, okay, maybe it is. But like the original Yu-Gi-Oh has a really great poignant ending as well. But it doesn't have the same themes of like, it's not okay. <laughs> and that's just what I appreciate about Yu-Gi-Oh GX. Growing up, maybe it's not okay. <laughs> And even now at the ripe old age of 27, it's just something that still resonates with me. I feel like the older I get, the more Yu-Gi-Oh! GX just hits different. I don't know. And I know you're probably like, Karina, it's not that deep. What about dinosaur DNA? What about the guy who fucks a tiger? What about beep beep ka-chow? And it's like, that stuff only makes it better. And that's why Yu-Gi-Oh! GX is the best. <laughs> dog barking <laughs> so yeah thank you for listening to me talk about why Yu-Gi-Oh! GX is factually the best Yu-Gi-Oh! series I know everyone already agreed with me but if you don't agree with me feel free not to tell me because I don't care boo me all you want I can't read anyway if you like this video let me know I guess Maybe I'll do another unscripted Yu-Gi-Oh! rant where I talk about how Kaiba is the tragic hero of Yu-Gi-Oh! I'll do it. <laughs> anyway, thank you for listening. Bye!